Mr. Larry Ma, Ma is that how you pronounce it? Maza? Maza or Maza. Maza or Maza? Yeah. Okay. Cool, man. Well, uh, I appreciate you coming here and doing this. Oh, doing my, this with me, man. My pleasure. Oh, uh, boy. Cocoa Beach. You live in Cocoa Beach. Yes. What's it like living over there? Uh, you know, it's uh, it's a little quieter than like the Tampa area. Uh, very yeah, definitely. It's beachy. It's right on the beach. Yeah. So, uh, and it's old school. They really haven't caught up with the times yet. Like uh, you know, Miami and Fort Lauderdale. There's uh, not many high rises. Most of them are. Uh, I think they stopped at eight stories. <laughs> yeah. You know, the condos. So yeah, yeah, Cocoa Beach is an interesting place, man. <laughs> yeah. Hometown that, of Kelly Slater. Yes. Yep. They got yep. they got the nice big yeah. shrine of him yeah. right there on the main entrance. Yeah. Yeah. And I got a gym there. Oh, do you? So, yeah. Someday they're gonna have a shrine in me. Okay. I've Hell yeah. Trained so many people at Cocoa Beach over the years. <laughs> well, yeah. So that's awesome. Do you yeah. do you ever surf? I never surfed. It's a big no. surf town. No, I I never did it in my life. I enjoy the ocean. Yeah. I love the waves, all of that, but I have yeah. never. Uh, Never uh, surfed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So for people who aren't familiar with your your story, and uh, I know you have a book out, and yes. then you just sold, or what did you you optioned your film to a big company I, that purchased optioned it? my life rights. Okay. And uh, to a, a company that Joe Paletto uh, is the producer, uh -huh. and he's ultimately going to have his own platform, his own Netflix type, of, and it's going to happen very soon, probably in a few weeks. So he's looking for uh, lots of material. He's uh, already uh, licensed probably hundreds of movies. So it's going to be a mob TV like 24-7. Oh, cool. So, yeah, that's going to be a real uh, – and like I said, it's just weeks away now. Wasn't there also a movie or something that you starred in that you – Well, I didn't star in it. I was a consultant uh, to De Niro in The uh, Irishman. Oh, okay. And I did get a part in the movie. I played a hitman. <laughs> So, oh wow, yeah. that's recent, right? That movie, yeah, that, that movie, movie came out. Yeah, a just years ago. last year. Yeah. Oh, okay. It, it, right, baby. Yeah, I think last year it came out. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but yes. for people who aren't familiar with the story, just give me like a brief background of who you well, are, and where you came from. You know, it's it's always nice to start it that way, uh, the way you did, because it's such good stuff. I've got you know where I am now. It's it's a blessing. I have, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a screenplay in the in the works. Uh, Nick Pelleggi's writing it. Uh, Terry Winter is also involved. He, he's, you know, written The Sopranos and, uh, you know, so many movies like wow. American Gangster, Boardwalk Empire. But, uh, you know, and, and what got me there was uh, the, the cops that were on my case. Uh, they were part of the task force back in, I guess, around the 90s, uh, 90, 89, 90, 91. Ardell De Niro's private security. Really? So, yeah, after they retired, they went into that. And when he was looking for somebody, they all knew me well, and they says, Larry's the guy you want. He read the book. Uh, it's called The Life, and he said it was terrific several times. Uh, and he had a plan for it, but, you know, he's so busy and got so much going on in his life, it's too slow for me. So this Joe Paletto came in and took it, and, and we're moving. But... Uh, but now go back to what got me is, uh, you know, I was uh, a, a made guy in the Colombo family and I, you know, I didn't start out that way. I started out a normal upbringing. My father was a lieutenant in the fire department. My mom worked in a bank. Uh, you know, we went to Catholic school, my brother, my sister, myself. And, you know, we had everything we wanted growing up, you know, not that we were rich, <clears throat> but. We were expected to do well in school. You know, we were pressed to do well. And I went all the way up to college. I did a, uh, a year of college, John Jay College, criminal justice. So, yeah. <laughs> it's ironic, huh? Yeah, that's funny. But, uh, but somewhere, you know, just about six months before I went to college, I met an older woman while I was working in a supermarket. Uh, and her name was Linda. And very attractive. Uh, and, like, I was not quite 18, and she was about 32. So it was sort of a mutual attraction and seduction, whatever word you want to use. We wound up having an affair. Uh, I found out soon after that she was married. Uh, I knew she had two kids, but I never met the husband. The husband was always gone. He was always away. So I was assuming he was a businessman or uh, a, a doctor just with crazy hours. Get that thing a little closer to you. Okay, just, yeah. pull, just, pull it, just pull it towards you. Yeah. 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 And... Uh, or you can scoot. Yeah, either Where's way. You? And ultimately, I find out later on uh, that he is one of the bosses in the Colombo family. 
And his name's Greg Scarpa. And they called him the Grim Reaper. He had the, I mean, he told me he stopped counting at 50 bodies. And he's probably got 100 or 200. I mean, it's uh, probably one of the most feared mob guys in history. Uh, yeah. So. Holy shit. The, yeah. The way I found out was. Now, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. When you were that age, did you know anything about mafia? Not a lot. I knew uh, there was these social clubs all over the place where the guys always dressed better and never worked and had the caddies, that type of thing. You knew it was there, mm -hmm. but I didn't know anything about uh, the rules or the the uh, uh, the real actual lifestyle, the life. I didn't really know what it, what it meant to be in that life. Uh, until later on, obviously. So, and I did have an Uncle Albert who was a, a dinosaur with the Colombo family. He died at like 93 years old or 94 years old. Uh, and he was very, very well liked in and out of that life. He was one of those guys that you see in like in movies that where they like the mob guy. He was that guy. Greg, on the other hand, was just a vicious, uh, greedy, you know, uh, ruthless mob guy so uh and i've wound up somewhere in between because growing up under greg scarpa you had to produce you couldn't be weak uh you couldn't show any weakness so i learned to be uh, a, a a gangster like greg it's summer camping season let's talk about pitching tents that's right this episode is sponsored by blue chew confidence can take you extremely far in life, especially when it comes to in the bedroom. If you're a two pump chump like me and you want to go 20, 30, 40 minutes, that's where Blue Chew comes in. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable tablet and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them day or night so you can plan ahead or be ready for whenever the opportunity arises. The process is super simple. Just sign up at bluechew.com and consult with one of their licensed medical providers and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part about it is it's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Bluetooth tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped directly to your door in a discreet package. Trust me when I tell you this shit is the real deal, okay? They always say first impressions are the most important, but what about lasting impressions? You may already perform well, but who doesn't want an enhancement? Who doesn't want more longevity? Who doesn't want to go another round? Women say there's nothing sexier than confidence, and Blue Chew can help give you the confidence where it counts. So if you could benefit from going an extra round or playing a couple extra minutes in the fourth quarter, Blue Chew can help. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. You can try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code CONCRETE at checkout and just pay $5 shipping. That's promo code CONCRETE, K-O-N-C-R-E-T-E. -E. That's bluechew.com, promo code CONCRETE to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring this podcast. Okay, so you're, you're having an affair with this woman who's over more than 10 years older than yes. you. Yes. And then you find out that she's married to a guy who's an infamous murderer. Right. How does that not freak okay. you out? How do you not well, run for the hills when you it find did. that? It did, but here's what happened. She broke it like little bits and pieces. She said, told me first he was an influential guy. Mm. He could help you in business. And they actually put me in charge of sales. Their sales they had a company, uh, paper products and fire extinguishers, cleaning supplies to furnish uh, you know, all kinds of businesses, restaurants. And uh, they just made me the sales manager. Just came in and she told him that she had a guy that can do it. And next thing I know, I meet him that way. Uh, so now going to different establishments to get the business, if they said no, the next day he would send somebody to the place and say, all right, Larry, you go back tomorrow. I would go back. They were so happy to sign me up. So the business was, so I started understanding, you know, uh, of exactly what he was. But where I. So he was strong arming people to do business with you. Yeah. To get, to make sure they gave me the business. Yes. His, that was his influence. Uh, and it was going well for a while. But what happened was because now I 
knew him personally and he was helping me and making me successful in this first legitimate business, I started feeling guilty and paranoid. I says, now it's really, really bad. If he finds out, he's got to kill me. You know, I know who he is now. So this went on for months and he saw the, you know, I did some things that were paranoid. Like when he would call me to a meeting, I wouldn't go. I said, he's going to kill me tonight, you know, uh, or if he wanted me to drop him off downtown or bring him somewhere. And I was always the one to do it, but I started worrying. I said, one of these trips, I'm not coming home, you know. Because he's going to find out about you yeah. and his wife. Yeah. So ultimately, somewhere along the way, they discussed it or uh, she told him, you know, there's, there's a lot of theories now. There's people think he might have known from the very beginning, very possible. Uh, some say, well, the other thing you got to know is he had two other wives. Yes. At the same time? Yes. So he had three. He had one that was living in Vegas, an Israeli beauty queen. He had uh, Connie, who was his first wife uh, with the, his first children. And, uh, and then he had Linda, who actually was a common law. I don't think, I'm pretty sure they never got married. You know, well, we found that out later on. So he was juggling three lives, uh, three wives and three lives. So the other theory is that I made it easier for him because his youngest wife now wasn't going to complain when he wasn't around. She mm. had, a, you know, her own little toy or her own. Keeping her occupied. Right. So, uh, so anyway, he confronts me with it one day. We're driving to the club. And he knew because just to, a couple of days earlier, I didn't show up somewhere. And he said, this is not like you. He said, something's wrong. So on the way, he started breaking the ice. And it's just us two in the car. And we would get to the club every day about a half hour before the rest of the men showed up. And on the way, he's saying things like he loves me like a son. He you know, Linda loves you. Uh... I'm going to have this conversation with you because I think you're very mature for your age. I'm only 19 now. I, this was about a year and a half later we had this talk. And we wound up getting out of the car, walking into the club. We go. He sits down behind the desk. I sit at my spot on the other side of the desk like we do every day. And he's going on. And finally he says, I know about you and Linda. So my heart's beating. And I remember always saying that I would never admit it. I would never, ever admit it. I just, I just have to deny it. But something came over me like it was uh, do or die. It was time. I mean, I, I loved her. I didn't want to not be with her. Uh, and my answer to him was, Greg, I have a lot of respect for you. You know that. And I think you are far from an idiot. <laughs> but only an idiot wouldn't see it, what was going on. I mean, he knows I'm there, you know, you know, uh, constantly. I'm with her all the time, even when he's away. Uh, you know, and I, I, I didn't believe he really thought I was helping her around the house and shopping for her. You know, I mean, come on. Uh, after all this time. So I sort of, maybe deep inside, I knew that he knew. Uh, it's just a weird, weird time. It was very rough. It was tough. But now, the weight of the world was off my shoulders. Mm. But I did learn one of the main rules that day. He took me outside, you know, we would hang out on a parking meter, lean on the meter, get some sun, and he told me uh, that it's okay. He says, I'm fine with it. If anybody outside the three of us finds out, he says, you and I will be killed. It's a rule. Somebody could kill the Grim Reaper? Well, yeah. We're breaking a, a, one of the rules that is told to you the day you become a made guy. You know, you never turn on the family. You, you have to uh, come whenever the family calls for you. They come first. No drugs. Obviously, Omerta, no talking to the law. And no messing around with other people's wives or girlfriends. Mm. You know? So I learned that rule that day. But as the years went on, I also learned every one of those rules is broken. It's a facade. Wow. Everyone. There were so many guys dealing drugs. Uh, so many guys dealing with the feds. My boss himself was a 30-year informant. You know, that's like the coup de grace, the end of the story of my life, to find out that he was, you know, an yeah. informant for 30 years. That's interesting. I had a yeah. guy I had a guy on here. I think the only other guy that I've had on the show who was, uh, like, previous mafia was uh, John A. Light. Yeah, Johnny, I know. And he was saying yeah. the same thing, basically. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's no... Yeah, no, it, it isn't. Uh, like I said, the drugs loyalty. is running rampant. Uh 
uh, you know, there were guys messing around with people, that, and it was known. It was like John Gotti was uh, with his boss at the time, uh, Della Croce. He was with the daughter. And Sammy the Bull told me that. He didn't have to lie about it. He, you know, he says he's, you know, the biggest hypocrite of all of us, <laughs> you know. Uh, he was big into the drugs. He was sleeping with his boss's daughter. And she, they were both married. I mean, it was, a, you know. So Sammy the Bull was running around the same time frame? He was, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. was he in a different? He was a Gambino family. Gambino so another, family. Another family. We were the Colombo family. But I was friends with him in the street. We played ball together. Really? Uh, racquetball. Uh, what was he, he like? Um, Sammy was no nonsense. Uh, tough guy all the way. Uh, a killer. A uh, big money earner. And did you know, like, this guy's a killer? Well, later on I did when I was in the life, yes. This is yeah. not like you're just like, hang, you hang no, out with these guys, no, you guys no, are both of them. No, no. You, this is not casual conversation. No, we used to go to the, to the same racquetball and weight club. So, and he was into boxing, I was into martial arts, and then boxing also. So, we actually sparred a few times. You know, uh, but he's, uh, I like him. I like Sammy. He's very witty. He's a smart guy. Uh, and, you know, he's a survivor, obviously. You know, to to be up against what he was up against. You know, everybody wants to call people rats and things like that. But I always say there's a lot of different ways to break that rule. Okay. Some guys uh, cop out and admit things that are hurting the next wave of defendants. That happened on my case, where guys came in, they admitted there was a war, they admitted they were part of the Colombo family. They don't have to prove that anymore. These guys just admitted it, so that becomes evidence against you, okay? But they got their reasonable deal, and they were happy. Uh, John Gotti talking on the tapes the way he did, and being flamboyant, and being in the public eye the way he was all the time, that's not a good thing, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and then other guys do it, like my boss did, the smartest way of all, just be partners with an FBI agent your whole career. You'll never get arrested. And that's what happened with him. Wow. Yeah. Uh, he sold his own son out, Greg Jr., who I'm uh, still very friendly with. Uh, he did 33 years, Greg Jr. And when the father died, uh, he did a deathbed confession. And he saved other people. He didn't put me or his son as part of the deathbed confession, exonerating us. So it's, yeah, and he, uh, yeah, it's, it's. And is there stuff that he could have said that would have exonerated of course. you? He could have said that uh, all I did was drive him places. He was my driver. He didn't know anything about the hits. It's what he did for Alley Boy, Persico, mm. uh, who was the boss of the big boss of the family, Carmine Persico's son. And while I was away, Alley Boy told me that him and his father knew about Greg for the last 20 years. so Knew about him talking to the FBI. Yes, I knew that he was, yeah, yeah. And then I found out later on there was an actual case uh, from one of the attorneys on our case that I, I'm friends with now way after. There was a, a very big tax indictment, okay? And about eight of the guys, heavyweights in the family, were all indicted. Greg was one of them. So they all show up to the first arraignment. And it gets delayed. You know, they always put it off for, for weeks. They come back to the next one. They're all there except Greg. They have to delay it again. A few weeks later, they show up again. No Greg. The fourth time, they show up. No Greg. They throw the case out. Okay? So those guys, Junior Persico was on that case. So he had to know something. But either he felt he helped us, so what's the problem? Right. Plus, they knew he could kill without having a problem. Right. They're never going to arrest him. So they had him doing a lot of work over the years. Plus, he was an enormous earner. So all those things, mm. they, they gave him a pass for having a, uh, being partners with a, uh, an FBI agent. Is that is that a super rare, valuable trait in somebody to be able to murder without emotion? Uh, yeah, there's, and the truth that it is because most of the guys that I know aren't that way. Like you know, even Sammy. Sammy, you know, uh, he told me he says I never, you know, Pete. They got me like I love killing. I don't. I hate it. I hate it. I, and he says, and when I get 
when I have to do it, he says, I'm so mad at the person for breaking a rule and forcing me to have to do this. Mm. You know, it's business. It's, it's, it's hard to realize that, but, uh, and they say the human body can get used to anything. You can endure anything. And eventually it just becomes a way of life, you know? Uh, but, yeah, but Greg, Greg could kill you. Uh, like there, there was an, uh, a lawyer that once described him as good looking, articulate. Uh, he said something like he could sit down with judges and lawyers, have dinner with you, and for dessert he'll kill you. That's how they described Greg, you know. And we had the tape. This 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 uh, a lawyer got caught with heroin got arrested, so he immediately cooperated. And they were interviewing him about all the guys from the Colombo family that he dealt with. Mm-hmm. And we had the tape. So how do we get that tape? You know, Greg's connection got it. Right. And this was became, as we look back on, you know, uh, in time, the handwriting was on the wall. We just couldn't believe it, knowing he was such a killer. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what happened during the war, which, I mean, really uh, made it certain. But there were things like Greg... Junior told me that just weird things that would happen where his father wasn't part of something. The next day, he found out that they all got pinched. You know, right. a lot of that. Uh, but there's a lot more of that going on. They're, you know, like Whitey Bulger. Yeah. You know, I'm sure those aren't the only two. Mm. You know, there's... Uh, yeah, Whitey Bulger. He, that's a fascinating story yeah. about him. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. how, and how, yeah. the, how they tested, did those experiments on him in prison. I don't know if you yeah. heard about all that stuff. No, I didn't. I didn't. It's all that. The, the, uh, There's like a famous uh, government program called MK Ultra during the, during the, um, what's the serial killer's name? Charles Manson. Dur- during his yes. whole era, okay. his reign, they, uh, they were testing these mind control, CIA mind control tactics on prisoners. Mm. Uh, by basically giving them certain doses of LSD every single day. Wow. And they were doing that to Whitey Bulger while he was in prison. And he, I think he talked about it, but it was like a CIA oh, like experiment, a that, mind yeah. control experiment. Wow. Huh. Um, anyways. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious about like what, what kind of like human traits did you notice in a guy like this? Gregory, who, who what that makes him able to just murder somebody. Well, you know, it's the same thing. It's it's it becomes second nature. He 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 was a he was born in the life. I mean, at 15, 16 years old, he was already in the street stealing, beating people up, mm, doing all the things right. that. Uh, so he's conditioned, an, an, very very young, an, age. an up and coming guy. And somebody that's already in the life sees this trait in him. Sees that he's he's uh, he's tough. Uh, he's got balls. He's got you know got what it takes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then they groom you. Okay, I was groomed. I was taught. I educated the way to life. Uh, I don't think that's happening anymore today because I could see the different people that are in the life now. Uh, it's not the same. It's definitely not the same. They, they, they miss that grooming and teaching and, and having a person become uh, a consummate wise guy that when you walk into a place, they know who you are. They, you don't have to tell them. They say, this guy's uh, somebody to respect. And Greg always had that. He got straightened out. I think he was 18. He got his button. What does that mean? Uh, when you get made into the family. Okay. Uh, officially inducted. Okay. To become an official member of the family. Uh, to have it at that age, you had to have somebody that saw a lot about you. Uh, and he loved money. He loved money. So there's nothing he wouldn't do to earn money. I mean, every, every racket there was, he was in. Uh you know, from Joker Poker Machines to the number business, Shylock, and he was a Shylock to Shylocks. What's a Shylock? You lend money uh, at exorbitant rates. So you give a guy $1,000, and you could charge anywhere from, he would charge me $10, but I would charge 30 40 or 50 per week. That's the interest. They have to pay that every week until they hand you back the 1000 Okay. So he had, uh, he was making, I mean, just what I knew about from, the close guys, about twenty five thousand a week in interest, every week, without fail. Nobody and missed payments. All the people that were getting these loans from him knew that the collateral was their life. Yes, or? well, <laughs> their their well being. Right, you know, he would probably They're kill them. Get because, their legs broken. Right, or something. right. We went to work on guys all the time that didn't pay, and uh, even that become, you know, second nature. It, it, you know, they start you out 
where you're doing, uh, where somebody you're beating up did something very bad, like robbed an old woman in the neighborhood, okay? Or found out they were selling drugs by the school. We go give them a beating. You feel proud in a way. You think you did the right thing. You got this drug deal away from the school or you got even with uh, uh, this person that robbed some a friend's mm-hmm. grandmother, mm-hmm. you know? Then you participate just because a guy owes money, but you're already seasoned. They, they take baby steps. They never ask you to kill your friend. That's like a myth. Like your best friend. No. They're not going to ask you. Right. The ones they're going to ask you to kill is somebody, again, early on, somebody that did something really bad. Later on, it becomes looser. This guy, you know, had a fight with uh, Junior Persico's nephew, and Junior Persico's nephew lost the fight. We have to go kill the guy. I mean, it's a fight. Yeah, so I got in fights him. growing up. If I, if I, I would have been killed five times for winning a fight. You know, I lost fights too. Don't get me wrong, but uh, it's just uh, I actually got called to a meeting uh, that I had. A, I was in an after hours, and we weren't supposed to be in after hours. What's the after hours? Okay, the, the nightclubs close at four o'clock. Uh huh. And there's clubs that open at four. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah and they're illegal, but you know they were all around. Uh, so I was in one of these places, and I get in a beef with, uh, I find out later on, it's Paul Castellano's nephew. I didn't know. And he picked a bad time because I was really at the peak of my martial arts. I was good, and I won the fight, okay? I didn't abuse him. I didn't keep hitting him when he was down. Once he went down and I walked away, it was over. The next night, I get a call. I have to go to the diner. And it's like late at night, almost morning. It's one of those 24-hour diners, you know. Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, why do I got to go see Greg at 2 o'clock in the morning? You know, it's it's a little... Oh, it's Greg you had to go see? Well, he's doing that call for me. Right. So I get there. I see Sammy the Bull hanging out outside. He says hello to me. I walk in. Who's sitting? Scappy, our captain, Greg, and Paul Castellano. You're shitting your so pants. So I, I, no, I don't know what happened yet. Greg, oh, okay. Greg now comes over to me and walks me outside or to the front door, and he says, what happened last night? I said, what are you talking about? I says, I, we went out. I says, you got a beef? I said, oh, yeah, I got a fight. I says, you know, I says, you know it happened <laughs> once in a while. He says, well, that was Paulie's nephew. So I said, I didn't know. And he's telling me he wants satisfaction. He wants to kill me. <laughs> so Scappy, but I learned the lesson here, too. So Scappy is talking on our behalf. He's captain. He was he was a boss for a while, very well respected. And uh, so I remember now he, he's, Paul's talking to me. He says, if it wasn't for Scappy, I'll say, you'd be dead already. Now, Greg got mad. So he says, if a hair is harmed on his head, I said, you'll find more bodies in the street. Now, Scappy had it. Greg, you know, he shouldn't have said that. But, He's feared. Paul would have shit his pants if they had to go to war together. You know, they, Paul was no Greg. Right. He was a right. boss and he was a businessman. So anyway, long story short, I had to like, I owed Scappy my life now. Right. Because he saved me. So now I owed him. What kind of a guy was Scappy? Was Scappy, old school, old time mob guy that died in prison. Uh, he got a, uh, 133 years. And he's the guy that they quoted the newspaper. When he got the 133 years, he looked at Junior Persiger. He says, well, we only got to do two thirds. <laughs> and it was in the newspaper. And when he got the time, he was about 65. So right. obviously he was never coming home. Uh, Junior never came home. Uh, so anyway, the funny part of this is after it's over with, I walk outside. I talk to Sammy real quick. And he said, he, uh, while I'm walking away, he says, you should have killed that cocksucker. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he didn't like shit. The kid. He didn't like the kid. So that was funny, yeah. So Sammy, did Sammy kind of have your back too? Was Sammy well, part of the he, same gang? Or? No, he was. He was there on, to be with. Uh, he with was the cat, other guy. He was, yeah, yeah, oh, with Paul Castellano, fuck. the Gambino family. But we were friends, and so I says we we had a rapport, you know. And uh, he knew me. So if this guy would have had his way, Sammy would have been the guy to kill you. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't. That's a good question. 
Uh, could be. Could be. That's a great question. God. I don't know that. Yeah, I, I, I don't think Greg would have allowed me to get in the car there. And then the other thing is this. Uh, typically, they wouldn't let somebody else do it. If it came down to, and I'll tell you a story, where I had to be killed, my own family would do it. They weren't allowed Gambinos to do it. And there's a reason. They figured they'll torture me, they'll make it real hard. You want them away? We'll get rid of them. We had a friend of ours, Tony Frezza, who used to uh, like to go out and drink, and when he did coke, he got a little crazy, and he liked the coke. So he's in Sammy's club called Tally's. And he winds up getting out of hand, acting crazy, whatever. The owner, Joey, Joey D'Angelo was his name, tells him he's got to leave. And he's a good fella. Tony wasn't a wise guy. So he doesn't go. So now a couple of the guys bounces. They physically take him out. He goes home, gets his gun, comes back, and kills the good fella. That's a mortal sin. Can't even raise your hand to a good fella. So he winds up, Scappy tells him, get out of town. He goes down, comes down to Florida. I might have been in this area, Tampa. Really? <laughs> so he comes down to Florida. Yeah, I think it was Tampa. It's funny. And he's trying to sort this out. So he goes to have the meeting with the Gambino family. And I'll never forget this either. We know he's at the meeting, and we're waiting for him to come back. We all like Tony. He's one of us. He's a tough guy. He's good. You know, we all like him. He comes walking in, Scap. He used to walk in, you bouncing his keys in his hand. So we heard him come in. And he always said, gentlemen. He said, that's what he did. He says, gentlemen. And we're all waiting. He says, I got good news and I got bad news. He says, the bad news is Tony's got to go. The good news is we get to do it. How chilling is that? That was the good news. But I understood they would have probably tortured him for what he did to Joey D'Angelo. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, and I was on the outskirts of that, one of my early hits. Uh, Were you there for that? Yeah, I, was, I wasn't at the actual shooting, but I was there. Uh, I, I actually picked Tony up with Mario at the airport and drove him to where... Uh, Greg Jr. was waiting for him. Did he know that he was about to be executed? No. He thought, as a matter of fact, we made a stop, and Mario ran in and bought Coke. Really? So he thought we everybody was going to go party. And I, at that time, I didn't do a lot, a lot of you know, yeah. drugs or anything. I, I drank a little bit. But yeah. uh, anyway, uh, and the hole was already dug in, in, the, in the woods behind Gregory's house. God, and what? That, somebody flipped years later and, and, and told where the body was. Why wouldn't they just be like, like if they really like loved this guy like a brother, why wouldn't you just be like, yo, go to the Bahamas, don't come back? That's or, what that's what I said I would have done. Uh, again, it's a difference, but a guy like Scappy, who lives by the rules of Cosa Nostra, he probably couldn't live with himself. He says if it was the other way around, if they hurt one of our good fellas, you know, We'd want the same satisfaction. Right. So there are guys at a certain level who live this life that know the rules, and they just taking it to the grave with them, you know. Uh, Plus, I guess you have to always be have that concern in the back of your mind. If this guy does come back, then if, we're really yeah, fucked. Then there's a war. Then there's a war, and then they could ask for two guys. And then Scappy's life could. Yeah. You lied to us, you know. Right. So yeah, uh, and there were others. I mean, Bucky. Uh, was a friend of ours that, but not a good fellow so when I say that, but he was our friend uh, that got into the drug business. And he was supposed to, he was told to stop. And this is why it's hypocritical because just five, six years later, we were the biggest drug crew in Brooklyn. And I'll tell you how that happened in a minute. Uh, but Bucky got killed for dabbling in, 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 in the drug business and, uh, uh, and he was one of us. But again, it was a rule. You're not supposed to be dealing drugs. Did, could you guys find a more humane way to, like, kill your own... I mean, these guys are kind of like your friends. I mean, did you just always shoot them? Or was there a better way to no, do it? No, they, 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 the only thing I ever knew was a gun. Yeah. Uh, I never heard of guys with knives. Uh, never heard of poison. The only bombing I heard of was when they tried to bomb John Gotti. And they got uh, uh, Frankie DeChico instead who was on the Paul Castellano hit. 
and it was another family, mm. the the Chin's family, and some of the other families never sanctioned that hit that John Gotti did on Castellano. You can't kill a boss. It's a rule. You just can't do it. Because if that starts happening, uh, John's own consul, yeah, told him, what you did, there's a bullet waiting for you now. You broke a rule. Yeah. And also, who's going to want to be the boss if you could just start whacking bosses to take over? Mm -hmm. You know, so you don't hear about it that much. It's very rare. Mm -hmm. And it's even more rare to kill a, 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 a consul, yeah, because a consul, yeah, is his position is to save lives. Right. And like, like that night with me, if they, well, if it was our family, this was two different families. So, but if it was he, the consulate, he's like the lawyer, the negotiator. The yeah. Guy, the, but he's the mediator. He, he's not, he's liked and respected by all the captains and all the good fellas. Okay. Okay. So if he calls you to a meeting at two in the morning, you go and you have no, you have all the confidence in the world. You're not getting killed. And again, that's a, a sacred rule of the life. So if you really believe in the life and the and, and he calls you, you go. You know, that slipped over the years too because guys in that position were shouldn't have been in the position. They were cold blooded killers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's typically a position where guy did his work, made his bones over the years, he's well liked, he's smart, he can almost like you said, the, the movies make it like a lawyer, like Tom Hagen in The Godfather. Uh but it's a, as a matter of fact, Greg told me that's the best position in the family because mm -hmm. you're untouchable and it's a lifetime assignment. Mm -hmm. They can never break you. If you're a captain, they could demote you. Mm -hmm. If you're the underboss, he could demote you. If you're a consul, yeah, it's for life. And that's the other reason it's such a, a, a trusted position, you know? So, uh, you know, when, when, uh, that's why Sammy the Bull couldn't be the consul, yeah. He, He'll kill too fast. You know, he'll kill you before he negotiates. Uh, and was that just because of the, is that just his nature or was that his, because well, that was his yeah, job? Yeah, no, it's probably his He would kill people yeah. whose job wasn't even to kill him? Well, he. Like, well, they know, weren't all uh, orders. Usually it was orders from the top. Right. And he would be the guy because they know it, it would get done. Okay. But I'm sure, just like Greg and most of us, we had some. That weren't put on record. Just emotional killings. Just, just not emotional, but where you know you, even though you're not going to get the approval, you still want the guy. So we were involved in a few of those with Greg, you know. Uh, but I remember him telling me, I put so many on record, and I've done so many hits for the family, they'll never question me if I if a guy turns up dead. They're not going to think it was him because he's always does it by the book, except those four or five times, you know. Right. So, uh, and that was what hurt us. Our family would, would, would let us into a war. Carmine Sessa was a guy that I grew up with under Greg. He's a little older than me. Got his button first. Uh, then when there was a split in the family, which we'll get to uh, a little bit more, mm. uh, Vicarina asked our consulier, Jimmy Angelina, to approach all the captains. If all the captains, and Vicarina was named acting boss by Junior Persico when he got that 133 years with Scappy. Okay. Okay. But he didn't want to step down. He still wanted to be the official boss, even from prison. And he has that right. Some people say he was wrong to do that. That's a valid opinion. But the rule is if he doesn't step down himself or get voted out unanimously by all the captains, he's the boss. So Vic asked Jimmy Angelina, the consul, yeah, who all the men trust, to go and pull the captains, canvas them, see if they will all vote for me to be the official boss and vote Junior out. The problem with that is Junior has two sons that are captains. They're never going to turn on him, Junior Persico. Mm -hmm. He has lifelong friends like Scappy, Greg, and others that are never going to turn on him. But there's also guys that have vendettas against Junior Persico for whatever reasons over the years. So they jumped at the opportunity. So now there were two. There was a split in the family. There was the Persico faction and the Arena faction, and he has Jimmy go to all the captains, and they don't. None, you know, it's not even fifty fifty. Most of them are, are, are back in Junior. Uh, I shouldn't say that. It's probably about fifty fifty. Within two weeks, Jimmy Angelina's dead. And he's a consul, yeah. 
even me at this, you know, I'm, this is like 10 years into me being in the life. I've never heard of a council year get hurt or, or anything. It's a coveted, like I said. Vic Arena gets a message to Junior Persico that Junior, uh, that Jimmy was trying to take over the family. He was talking to all the captains. So Junior thinks he did the right thing by, uh, you know, the treachery. Turns out uh, that wasn't the case, obviously, because now he promotes Carmine Sessa from captain to consul. Yeah, Carmine and Greg Scarpa Sr. are close. He grew up under him. as another one. He's like a son to him. At 15, 14 years old, Carmine was already on record with Greg. And that's why he put him there. He figured he could convince Greg to come over. But when he came to see Greg Carmine, and Carmine Sessa came to see Greg, mm-hmm. he told him that Vic wants me to talk to all the captains. Greg busted out laughing. <laughs> he says he's going to do the same thing to you. He's going to have you approach everybody and say that you're trying to take over the family, just like he did to Jimmy. So, Oh, my God. So Carmine, this is the treachery that goes on behind the scenes. So wow. now Greg, now Carmine goes back. And he decides he's got to kill Vicarina, the boss, because he can't get the captains to come over. He botches the attempt. That's his first mistake. He should have told Greg what he was going to do. Vicarina would have been dead. Instead, right. he wanted to go and do it on his own and right. try to be that big, big shot, the console, yeah, whatever. He botched? He's trying, they botched to, trying to kill him? They, yeah, he had two other guys with him, and they just thought, uh, I guess they weren't prepared. I mean, they saw Do you know Vic, the details Vic, of what they tried to do? Well, they were in a car. And they saw, they knew Vic's uh, uh, daily routine. Mm-hmm. He came home just when he was supposed to, but he saw them in the car. So I guess he took off. So it was a, how'd you let them see? I mean, there's a whole bunch of questions to that, yeah. you know. I, and they still should have killed him. I mean, if they really went there to do it, so he saw you, big deal. Right. You know, that's why I says they, they weren't really uh, ready for that move. I think they didn't have what it really took. And right. if they would have had Greg with them, like I said, Vic would have been dead. Right. And I said if Vic, if he would have been on Vic's side, I remember later on in prison, Vic telling me he wishes he had us on his side. And I says, well, if that was the case, there'd be a lot of dead persicos. <laughs> that's what I told him. Uh, so uh, so anyway, that's that's how that, that war. And would, oh, just a, a month earlier, Jimmy called for Greg. Okay, Council yet called for him. Okay. Sent uh, if he wanted him to come to his club to talk to Greg. Right. Greg had just gotten out of the hospital. He had like multiple operations on his stomach. Uh, he had ulcers from taking aspirins with nothing, just popping aspirins all day long. He was nuts. He didn't want to get a headache. Mm. Even if he didn't have a headache, he took him. Mm. And he had me taking him with him. <laughs> and I was taking him for years, you know, a couple of years, two, three, then I stopped. Uh, but anyway... If you want to make it, if you switch yeah. those, yeah. the wire will probably be better. It'd probably be easier. Oh, I just switch, like switch the side. Yeah, there you go. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, very good. Yeah, that won't be crossing yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. I got to keep the head good. I got a so couple appointments today. The aspirins. Yeah. What were yeah. they? Well, that was just not to get a headache? Was there anything else? Any well, other, any you know, other? we would go for a drink every night after the club. The aspirins and the liquor have a nice uh, little effect. No, I think it's just so, you know, if you drink too much, you get a headache. Yeah. He had the aspirins first, so he wouldn't get the headache. Okay. That's that was his thinking. I do that with so, Advil sometimes. I wonder if it's uh, if that's bad for you. Oh, uh, you know, I don't know. I think it's the aspirin itself that is very acidic mm-hmm. and caused these holes in his stomach. Yeah, so yeah, they all yeah. they burst all at the same time. Anyway, he almost died, and he had to get a blood transfusion. This is another story that you can't make up. Thirty of us show up to give him blood. One match. First of all, he should have took the hospital blood. It was screened. They knew there was no AIDS in it. Mm. Uh, and this is right at the height of AIDS. Mm-hmm. One match, one of our guys, Paulie Pumps, big muscle guy. He's the match. He gives him the blood. It's, it's tainted with AIDS. So Greg winds up with AIDS. And Paulie got it from needles. He was a... Uh, steroids. Steroids. From, oh, yeah. Jesus. They would share him. Yeah, you know, he... he uh, I, I always say it because, I, you know, again, it, it's the way things are now, it doesn't even matter, but he wasn't gay. I mean, he had... Everybody thought right. it was a gay gay, gay thing. Right. And it was for the most part right. back yeah. then. Uh, but he was... Uh, he had more girls. I, 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 he, you know, he was polished. He's a 
first guy that taught me how to drink wine and taught me about the finer wines. Uh, so Paulie, uh, uh, but, uh, but, but, but it was divine inter- intervention that this is what God wanted for Greg to go out that way or just dumb luck, I don't know. But uh, he wound up with AIDS and he had enough money that he was able to survive it because he kept using all the trial drugs. Mm. Uh, but eventually he lost so much weight and, and the dementia was kicking in. And during the war, he had dementia. So we were out, you know, hunting. How old was he this time? Uh, probably, it's funny to say it. I, I, I got to say early 60s. Really? May, yeah, yeah. Because I met him, he was about 51, 52 when Linda was 32. Mm. He was like 20 years older than her. And this is 10 years later, 60, 61 years old. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. about it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, 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 I'm 60. So it's like, you know, you're making me think about it. I'm saying it's, yeah. it's really, I don't feel like I'm ready to go soon. No, yeah. dude, you look great oh, well, for 60, you, man. Thank you, thank great you, shape. Thank you. Appreciate that. But, uh, uh, so he eventually he died from that in jail. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, the war was a nightmare. How long yeah. after he was in jail did he finally die? Uh, probably four years. He still okay. hung on. Yeah, they sent him to the hospital in Springfield. Uh, I heard at the end he was like literally, I want to say like fifty pounds. Just, just really, uh, mm. you know, just started eating him up. But now was he was like. <sighs> In the beginning, when he was trying to groom you, mm-hmm. and like like he, t- he told you he was treating you and bringing you up as his own son, right? Was his objective to make you, turn you into a trained killer? Uh, no, he was turning me into uh, again the the only way I could describe it is the consummate wise guy. He wanted all of his guys when you walked into a place, they know you're a good fella, and not because you're banging the place up or get in fights just the way you carry yourself and the way you talk to others uh the way you dress you know uh the way you tip you know there's a whole bunch of things and he taught me every one of those he never walked into a restaurant where he didn't give the maitre d a 10 and then again this is back 30 years maybe we give him 20 now you know uh i still do that you know uh, the person that took me to to the to the uh table at burns i i tipped her yeah it's just it's just you know, she walked me to the table and she was shocked. But, uh, so no, so you had to be, and you had to be able to kill and hurt people when they, uh, they had to be hurt, you know? So yeah, it is a grooming and, and, and I, I, I tell you baby steps, the first hit that I was even privy to in any way, shape or form, I was asked to give a guy a flat tire. Mm-hmm. Okay, he gave me the ice pick, and that morning, very early in the morning, I went. I gave the guy a flat. I didn't think none of it. I thought it was, I silly. I thought he parked in his place or, or in his driveway or did something disrespectful, and he just wanted to give the guy a flat. The next day in the newspaper, man killed fixing flat tire, so he's was shot, and I didn't say anything to Greg about it. I read it. I knew it. I knew it was the car I gave the flat to, but I think it was my first little test. I lose you, don't have, you don't have to wear those. You can yeah. take them off. You sure? Yeah. Pause. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah it. Uh, that was my first test, mm-hmm. where he, if I would have came in like panicky, or Greg is that the same car like nervous, but I knew better, and I was probably only twenty, <laughs> but I was already around these guys. They treat me like an equal. Uh, I go everywhere with Greg. He's bringing me to meet other bosses, other captains. So I can't, I just know. Okay. A few months later, he asked me to go buy a shovel. I buy the shovel. A couple of, a year goes by, six months. It's not like we're killing every day. Somebody's got to go and it's Tony Frezza. So me and Gregory have to go buy shovels and dig a hole. Okay. That's what I said. The hole was already dug. Okay. Was well, yeah. that the first murder you witnessed? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that would be the first one that I was priv- really, really privy to. I, that I actually brought him to his demise, God. you know. Uh, but the, the later on, the first one that I, I, I was a crash car now, and uh, I was right on the scene, and I saw the guy getting popped, and they jump in the car and drive away. So that's what I'm saying. They don't ask you to pull the trigger for quite a while until mm. you're 
you've been around enough of them that you uh, you're kind of desensitized to it by the time yeah, you actually yeah have you know it's hard to use words uh, that's a great word to use uh, it's sad to say you know but that's a good word you you do get desensitized mm -hmm. that's a great way to put it because I fumble over that to say how it's possible right you know especially growing up the way I did from yeah. a, from a normal family uh, one of the cops on my case Tommy Dade's a dear friend to this day said in an interview. You know, one of those interviews among cops where they're trying to figure out, uh, you know, the mind of a killer or whatever you want to call it. And he said, he used, used me, he says, if a sweetheart like Larry Mazza could do it, anybody can do it. So, you know, it's how you're brought up. And, the, and here's the other thing you got to realize. We're recruited at a very young age where you're maybe easily misled or... or uh, you like the cars, you, 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 you gravitate, you like the Cadillacs, you like all the money, and you don't really know the bad side of it. So you're recruited at 15, 16, 17. I was 17. There were guys that were younger than me that were coming into the club. My point is, all these years later, they can't recruit me. They can't, nobody could recruit me to do something like that. I know better. I mean, I, I, I you know, I... I learned the hard way in some ways, but I, I would never, you know, I wouldn't, I, I, I you know, the hitman thing is another myth. I'm not a hitman, you know. It, the newspaper one day put an article out, hitman to testify against, uh, G, uh, what do they call him, a G-man, uh, G-man, G -man. hitman to testify against G-man. Because I wound up, that was my saving grace at the end. I, I mean, I, I made a deal with the government, but uh, basically it was about the corruption. Because uh, all their cases were going to get blown out of the water. You know, so... Uh, Whose cases were going to get blown out of the water? Well, all the, all the guys that were going to be going to trial, it came out now that Greg, my boss, was uh, an informant for 30 years. So they, we didn't know who it was who he was getting information from. We thought it was either a cop or somebody on the other side during the war, which I'll explain to you further. So we knew there was somebody. But now he admits, when, like, fast forward, while he's in, away, that he was, work, that he was a, a government informer. So he wanted leniency. Even at the very end, he wanted leniency after all the m murders we did during the war. You know, and the, the judge says, no. Can't do it. Not this time. And he sentenced him 10 years, which was life for him anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, wait, I, I went off track there. So we so just, if he uh, was protected by the feds. That's, for, that's, uh, why they would, that's why the trials would get blown. Not only that, this agent was giving us addresses of our enemies. So you're giving, he gave us oh, an address. Oh, a dirty agent. He gave us an address. So these are all the things, uh, and I'll get to them. Of uh, the, the last casualty of the war. Well, not really the last one. The last one that we did. Then when I was away, there were a couple more. Well, when, when we all got arrested. Uh, just sort of cleaning up the mess. You so know. Th but, did this agent get in trouble? Is that how Greg eventually No, got him and Greg were together for many, many years. Like, he was working for the feds for 30 years. Uh, it goes all the way back to the Mississippi burning story. You ever see that movie? No, I've heard about it. I'm okay. familiar with it. What's this, yeah. What is this? Can you tell, for people who haven't heard yeah. it, tell it. It's about uh, these three civil service workers that uh, they're fighting for uh, to abolish uh, the, the racial right, right, right. tensions and all of that. But the Ku Klux Klan in Mississippi was still very strong. And they killed these civil service workers. One was black and I think two were white. Mm -hmm. And they buried the bodies. The FBI couldn't get anybody to talk. None of the Klan's guys would talk. So they recruited Greg Scarpa. They brought him to Mississippi. And it's it. you could see it in the New York Times. This is very public now. He went, and the words that were told to me later on, because sometimes the FBI says more than they should, <laughs> was that he did unspeakable things. To, yeah. So, you know, that leaves you a little imagination. And then later on, I heard he had a knife to there. You know, the groin area. Uh, Cut their dicks off. Uh, it's, you know, again, <laughs> I, you know, I wasn't there, but, the, the, you know, these are things that you piece together yourself. Unspeakable right. things. You had a knife. It's not unspeakable if you're talking yeah. about a KKK yeah. member, yeah. though. No. Uh, no yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. cares? Yeah. He cut his balls and dick yeah. off. It's, right. It's right. all right. right. We can exactly. smile about it. <laughs> so, 
That's true. So anyway, he gets uh, he finally gets to the guy that knows where the bodies were buried. It's like only one guy really knew. Okay. And I, whether it was the second in command or whatever. And uh, so since that day, I used the term cop blanche. He had cop blanche with, to do whatever he wanted in the street. He was never going to get arrested. And he took advantage of that to, you know, I mean, making a money-making machine and a killer. Uh, God, he was making a good, he must have been getting paid quite a bit to be. Oh, he was getting paid too. Yeah, yeah. That came out later on in the trial. Uh, the FBI agent, I won't mention his name because he did beat the case. The reason he beat the case oh, was, really? was, yeah, uh, Greg's, the, Linda, the, 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 his last wife, the one that I was with for 10 years, just about, uh, had conflicting stories. Earlier on, and this is my deduction, she was still on the payroll to keep her quiet because she knew a lot about uh, this agent, okay? And once they stopped paying her, I think she got scorned, okay? Because now she had no money. She was not living well. Greg is, uh, is dead. So she comes clean and admits what she knew about him. So the things that I knew, okay, during the war, he would get... He, we had this big, I don't know if you're too young to remember, these big shoe phones, these big the stockbrokers used to do, carry. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, now everybody has a little I've cell phone. Pictures. We didn't have phones back then. So he would call somebody or the person would call on that phone and he would refer to the person as his girlfriend. It's my girlfriend, meaning his connection. Whoever it was, we didn't know. We thought it was a cop based on some of the information. Then we thought it could be somebody on the other side. He says, someday I'll tell you. He says, but he wouldn't tell us. Me and Jimmy, my partner, we're the only three guys were together every day during the war. Nobody else could come near us anymore because we knew somebody would give us up. Our own friends now mm -hmm. to get this over would, <clears throat> would kill us. Right. So we were, were one. The three of us were one. And he... Uh, uh, what was I talking about? What I, why did I lose my train of thought? Again? The the big shoe phone calling his girlfriend. Yes. So the, so we had, I had phone records. Later on, the feds got these phone records, so they know exactly who he was talking to. Okay, we had a, a scanner, which had a secret code, like a five or six digit, pick any five or six numbers, random, seven two one six five four three. We had that code. So we were listening to the FBI and local task force police as they were following us and our enemies. We knew when they were behind us. We knew where they were going. So how did we get this? Then it came a little later on, we were getting this information that had to be from surveillance. Like it came back like we knew exactly what time this guy leaves his house, 3.40 in the morning because he goes to a school bus company that he owns. Okay, we get there at 3.20, 3.40, the lights of the car turn on. Somebody was doing surveillance. Mm -hmm. So that information later on we knew, knew came from him. Right. We also had uh, access to FBI badges and credentials because he's, there was one guy he wanted to go and call him out of the house as the FBI and get him in the car, and once he gets put in the car... Greg was going to be sitting in the car. I mean, picture that scene, how that guy would have felt. No, he's in cuffs and he's sitting between me and Greg. You know, because the guy knew us. His, actually, it was Wild Bill, Billy Cotola. And he knew me, so I couldn't go to the door. But there were a few guys that he didn't know that would dress in cheaper suits than we usually wear and go up to the door and show the credentials and call them out and tell them, we're not going to cuff you in the house. You know, sometimes the FBI would do that. Uh, just we'll, we'll cuff you outside, you know, if they want to be nice, uh, not to do it, put, do it in front of the family, you know, because they know we're not typically going to shoot it out with them. Right. Uh, so anyway, we had this whole plan. So all these different things led to FBI. Okay. Later on, two of the agents themselves were, were sitting in the office with this agent, and they have an episode on The Sopranos about this. When the biggest hit of the war happened, Nikki Black, Nikki Grancio, who was Vic's choice for consul year, okay? When we got him, 
He banged the desk, the agent, and he says, we're going to win this thing. We're going to win this thing. The other agent says, we? Like, and then they started putting pieces together too. We had, this is what, what made them know. There's one agent underneath. This was a supervising agent who was bad. The underneath agent, the name's Chris. doesn't matter. I want to give his last name. Uh, gets an address from surveillance of where Vic Arena is hiding out. That's our number one target. If we kill Vic, the war's over. Right. Okay? He, Greg gets this address. Okay? We go there. There's no house on the lot. It's a wrong address. So, the only person Chris gave that wrong address to was his superior. How does Greg wind up with the same exact wrong address? So now they knew that he... They saw they followed Greg there or something? Well, no. Just, he only... Chris didn't give it to Greg. Okay? This address... He gave the address from surveillance. This is where to, to his superior. Oh, right, right, right. right. So he that's knew. the only. Right. So he's wondering how Greg got that address. You know, and this all came out in the trial later on. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how. You know, uh, how did Greg initially get? Like, if he had that protection, how did that protection dissolve? Because the other well, agents found out that yes. Chris was dirty. Well, well, no, Chris wasn't. His superior. His, his superior, supervisor. Yeah. Yes. And you won't give partially his Partially that. Partially that. We don't know his and, name. And, uh, well, you know, I, I, it's alleged. Yeah, yeah, his yeah. name's Lynn. Okay. You know, I, I see, I don't like to come on in because he beat he beat the case. Okay. So, I'm he not, isn't. He doesn't speak about it publicly. He or does. He does. He, does. Okay. he wrote a book. Oh, okay. You can read the book. It's called Deal with the Devil. Deal with the Devil. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and he's done documentaries. Oh, really? So, he's out there. I mean, yeah, just... Uh, just you you could research it and find okay. his name. It, it's just his first name's Lynn, uh, and uh, so the way it all ended was Greg at the at the end of the war. Okay, his dementia was setting in, and he wasn't making good decisions. His son Joe Joey, who's my godson, I stood up for him at confirmation. Winds up getting into the drug business. Okay, uh, and I'll backpedal that a little bit and tell you how we all how the, the club went downhill but joey was now in the drug business and i guess there was a corner that he claimed was his and somebody else was selling there so he went with a baseball bat the guy pulls out a gun so he leaves he comes back to the house he tells his father his father calls me i was home takes me five minutes eight minutes to get there depending on lights you know in brooklyn i drive to the house and he tells me what happened so I said, all right, I know the kid, Mike. I'll go talk to him. I know who he's talking about. We go to the corner. He's not there anymore. He probably knew something was coming. But before we go, Joey has a gun. I took the gun from him. I put it in the, in the glove compartment, and I locked it. I said, we're not going to kill the kid. Mm-hmm. Okay, your father asked me to talk to him and straighten this out. So this kid was I'm becoming a little nutty. He wanted to be like, like his father, you know. Yeah, he's got that complex. Misled to be, right, to be the Grim Reaper. So... We go looking, 15, 20 minutes, he's not around. I says, let's, let's go home. I go back, I tell Greg, I says, I think it's best anyway. I said, let everybody cool down. We'll find them tomorrow. Cool the heads. He agreed with me. He says, yeah, that, 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 right. I think you're right. I go home. I'm not home one minute. I don't have my clothes off. I'm getting ready to get on. And my, the phone rings, and it's Linda screaming on the phone, panicking like like a lunatic. She thinks Joey got killed, Greg shot. She just must. I'll be right there. She's telling me she needs me. Come over, come over, please. I get in the car, I drive back. On the way, I pass the block where this kid lives. There's unmarked cars, there's police cars, ambulances, fire department. I mean, it's a crime scene. I go around the long way, go to the house. I get to the house. The car that I was in has bullet holes all over it. Joey's friend, who was who was in the car with me also, with Joey, he was sitting in the back. Joey was sitting next to me, is in the back seat gasping, trying to get a breath of life. Every once in a while, I hear, <laughs> he's dying. I go upstairs into the house. Greg is on the phone. 
He has a scotch in front of him. He's got a towel. He got his eye shot out. Okay? And he's telling the parole people, because we were already, uh, he was arrested and was given bail, which is the biggest, the biggest force in the history of mankind because no mob guys get bail. Nobody. They gave him bail. And he had the bracelet on. So they were calling this as uh, the, your alarm went off. You were further than 50 feet from your house. And he's denying it. He's not, nah, I never left. I've been here the whole time. Now, I got to bring him to the hospital. Okay? What do you mean when you say he got his eye shot out? Oh, he went there with Joey. Joey was probably still breaking his chops. We got to get this guy. We yeah. can't let him do this. He pulled a gun on me. And probably, I, I knew he used to get under his father's skin. He said, all right, you want to kill him? Let's go fucking do it. You know, just like that. Just Let's go. So he goes. They were waiting. They were in front of the house. And there's about eight guys. As soon as Greg gets out, he starts shooting. They all shot. They opened up and shot. This kid's in the back seat. He gets hit in the head. Joey runs. He runs in the driveway. I heard a kid hit him in a garbage pail or something. So he wound up surviving. And the father gets his eye shot out. So I got to bring him to the hospital. There's four or five hospitals in Brooklyn that I could bring him to. He insists on going to the hospital that saved him, Mount Sinai in Manhattan. So I got to go through toll boots with cops. It's the days when the cops manned them at the tunnels. I got to drive through Manhattan with this guy dying in the car. And I do it. I'm so, I was loyal to a fault back then. Oh, the kid's still in the back seat? No, no, no. Okay. We took him, I took him in my car, Greg, uh -huh. big Greg. He's got a guy, he's going to die. He's going to bleed to death. Right. So I walk into the hospital with him, and the nurse comes, and she says, oh, my God, what happened? I said, he fell in the yard. I think a pipe went in his eye. <laughs> so she wheels him in the, they wheel him in the back. They put him on the gurney. They wheel him in the room. She gives me paperwork to fill out. She comes back out. She says, you stay right here. I know she saw a bullet. So when she walks away, I go to the door. And I open it. I says, Greg, I got to go. He's laying there like this. He goes like this to me. Thumbs up. That's the last time I've seen him in the free world. Really? Yeah. That was the last year because now they locked him up and they, he couldn't get bail again. And they had to leave him in Rikers Island for a while, which is a jungle. But they had the best AIDS unit because of all the junkies in there. Mm. And a few months later, I got arrested. Uh, you know, uh, they just rounded everybody up from the war. They had guys talking. Uh, four or five guys flipped. Call my Sessa, our consulier, the first one to flip, and call a big meeting. And at that meeting, everybody got arrested, except him. So I mean, that's uh, the treachery and the backstabbing is. There's no. There's no parameters. It's just. It's. Uh, uh, Mind-boggling. How the fuck did he survive getting shot in the eye? With AIDS and everything, yep. Yeah. And then the, the it, bullet, like what? what well, like, here's what happened. Here's what they said. It didn't go in this way. Okay. It must have deflected off the car and went in this way. Oh. Uh, so it didn't penetrate deep into the brain. Okay. Right, yeah. So. What a, yeah. lu a lucky yeah, well, and lucky, unlucky Yeah, well, time. exactly, exactly. So, but he was running out of his nine lives. You know, the AIDS was going to eventually, now being in prison, he was certainly not going to, you know, survive. You don't get good medical attention in there. Yeah. Uh, and how much time did you actually end up doing in prison? 10 years. I got a 10-year sentence. And what was your whole trial? What was your whole thing well, like? Well, uh, I didn't go to trial. I was offered the deal uh, to, to tell them what I knew basically about the corruption. Mm -hmm. Okay? I... Walked out three times because they wouldn't let my partner Jimmy come in under the same umbrella as me. They wanted to catch him, you know, make pub. He was on the limb. Jimmy was on the limb. I was in. Fl I got arrested in Florida in Cocoa Beach, as a matter of fact. Oh, really? I came down for a vacation after the war. I figured, let me just get out of here. I don't want this way. They don't see me around. And Jimmy and I had plans. He was going to come down and meet me, and we were going to drive off and go somewhere. Okay. You know, we we set up our pipelines and just to stay stay out of their faces. Time would have helped. Time would have helped because our boss, uh, I, I confuse you with our boss all the time. This Joe T was our acting boss on our side for the Persicos. And he went on the lam. They caught him, I think, s five, six years later. Okay? And they made a deal with him like that for five years. And he's the boss. Okay? Because... Is new prosecutors, they have their own cases, they don't want this one thrown up now, so they just, so if I, if we would have went on the lam, we would have probably got that same five year, seven year deal, you know, uh, but I, ultimately they says, okay, because they couldn't find them, they 
came back and they says, all right, we'll keep the door open for Jimmy. But, uh, and I couldn't admit knowing where he was. So I says, I'll see if I can get a message to him and, you know, I'll try through the grapevine, my family, somebody can, you know, I, I have no idea where he is, you know. Right. I really didn't. Uh, but I, I knew how to contact him. Right. We had that, you know. Uh, so he uh, he was able to come in. And, uh, you know, I, I had to cop out to zero to life. So if I would have lied or I would have gotten, uh, if they would have found out that I didn't come clean on things that I did, uh, I could have been charged or I could have got life. Ultimately, he gave me 10 years, the judge. Uh and, you know, the guys that, like Carmine, got three years. Sammy got five years. So the guys that really give them a lot will, will get in the door immediately. You know, but they, they didn't really like me because it was the corruption. It wasn't, uh, uh, you know, not that they didn't like me you know, personally, but the, the case that I brought them was basically their own. Right. You know, so right. they weren't going to fight tooth and nail. Like, give this reformed guy, a, a, give him a second chance. You know, they did what they had to do. They said he, he, he lived up to his obligation. How and much time did Lynn get? Did he get any oh, time? Oh, he didn't do anything. No, he, he beat it. Yeah, like I said, he, he walked out. So, uh, But the judge, it was New York Supreme Court. Because they didn't want to leave a stain the, on the agency. The ju- exactly. The judge said in his, uh, his closing argument or closing whatever that record is, uh, I read it, uh, said, even though you're walking out of this courtroom, I'm not convinced you're innocent. And he was the jury. It was he was the judge and the jury. He okay. waived the jury trial. Oh my gosh! Okay, uh, and he ripped into him. He ripped into the FBI for how they allowed this monster—that's what he called him—to mm-hmm. survive all these years in a partnership with you guys. So he he ripped them a new one, to put it that way. Uh, and he was the best judge. Out of all the judges I was around, I mean, mm-hmm. I had one. Our first judge, what's the word? Recused himself or recused himself? He stepped down. He told us, he says, "You can't get a fair trial with me. I think you're all guilty." <laughs> he said, uh, "And I feel like an honorary member of the Colombo family that I've heard so many of your cases." He says, "You can't get a fair trial." <laughs> so he left. We get this other guy, Sifton, who is the most miserable human being on earth. Even other judges hate him. They just was a hated man, and I wound up with him. And the same judge, uh, earlier on, at the very, very beginning, when I first met Linda, I was on the fire department test. I took the test. I got a 99, and I got a 95 on the physical. I was going to be called within, within a year to the academy. Mm-hmm. This same judge, because the, uh, at, at the time, minorities and women claimed the test was too tough. It wasn't fair. So it took him two years to rule on it, and then another two years to set the next date. So four years went by. I'm not blaming him, but it just shows you how some things happen in life. I would have taken the fire department. I was still early on. I didn't know Greg. Uh, it wasn't a year and a half in, two years into my relationship with him. When like Now he knew, and he was bringing me wow. along. Uh, and he's, a, he's the same judge that had to sentence me. Wow, yeah. how wild is that? Yeah, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. So, but this judge, going back to Judge, uh, it's something like Reebok or Reichbach, R E I C H B A C H, Reichbach. But research him. If you, he, he's, he's Reichbach, a, okay. Yeah, he was a really. Is he still, is he still. He a, died. No, he died. He died. But this guy, you know how they always wear the black robes? Yeah. He didn't. He wore a John Gotti suit. Really? Had his hair impeccable. But he was a smart, smart guy, and he would ask me questions. Like while I'm sitting in the in the, in, you know, even though the lawyers are asking questions, he says, "I want to ask a question," and he'd ask me a question. And very, br- just brilliant, and 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 he was very, very polite to me. You know, like the other judges, the Fed judges, you're you're a piece of garbage to them. You're nothing but meat that they're going to put away for life. They're all the same team. This guy was very fair. Mm-hmm. And that's why when it had to get thrown out, it got thrown out. But he told him, he, uh, "You're not innocent in my eyes." <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, uh, but he, he was able to, you know, obviously main, keep his pension and everything else. So mm-hmm. he would have lost all of that. What kind of a prison were you in? Was it like it was like a federal maximum security? Was maximum it? security? Uh, and then uh, as time went on, I wound up in uh, medium. Okay. A medium. But the Mediums very very were still pretty violent. Yeah. 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 But yeah. Uh, 
they are, but you, you, you could avoid that. It's not like, you know, again, like you see TV. There are prisons like that where there's just gangs and they're always, you know, that's their life. Yeah. You know, but most federal prisons are not that way. If you don't, if you're not into the state penitentiaries or gay stuff, yeah. you, you'll, you'll, you'll avoid the fights. They'll actually fight over a guy. Uh, uh, if you, if you don't gamble, which I did every single day, but I made sure everybody had put the cash up, you know, uh, stamps was cash in, in prison. Yeah. You want a better football game? <clears throat> cash has to be put up. That was my main business. Gam- uh, bookmaking. And I booked every day that I was away. I supported myself. That really? Way. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you, this is a funny story. I said it a, a thousand times. You're allowed three books of stamps. Everybody's equal. You can't have more than three books of stamps because you can use that for currency in there. Three books so, of stamps in what time period? Like At month, any one or? time. Like if they come and shake my room down, my cell. You can only have three in possession. Right. If they see ten books, they're going to write me up. Okay, I, that, maybe I go to the hole, maybe I get extra duty or whatever. When I got released, I had 2,000 books of stamps. Oh, my God. Yeah. What and I left fuck? them. I left them in there with different guys. I gave one guy 500, one guy, you know, uh, so it made their time. Because you use them for, I pay a guy a book of stamps to clean my room once a week. Pay another guy a book of stamps to bring me good food out of the, like broccoli and, and hard-boiled eggs. I don't want to eat the garbage. So, you know, it's you can live a little better. Right. If you, you know, if you want to, if you, if you got that mind, that's was always my mind. I says, I'm, I'm going to put these 10 years back on at the end. Were you still in contact with any of these mob guys when you were inside? Um, no, it's because it, everything's monitored. The phone calls, you know, you can't really call. Right. But didn't you say some of the guys, like, uh, one of the original bosses was still the boss after he got locked up? Yes. Like, how do you do that? Visits. He would do on visits. He okay. would have, uh, you know, Chucky was uh, a, a captain. That was his nephew that would go visit him. Uh, his son would go visit. So he would bring, he, and they put him all the way in California, Lompoc. And uh, he still would get messages. And that was also a problem during the war because his brother, Teddy, was not very smart. He was a, respectfully, he was a simple-minded guy, okay? Uh, he wasn't shrewd. He wasn't street smart. But he was going, because he's a brother, he can go deliver messages. And he wasn't bringing the right messages back. Ultimately, we found out he was soft-coated because Vic made him a captain. <laughs> so he sort of liked Vic. And, if, and, and I remember Junior saying, how do you make him a captain? His own brother. How do you make... You know, but he did it with the Machiavelli tactic, you know, by bringing one of the brothers as a captain. You know, he's showing uh, good faith. Right. You know? Right, right, right. But he was bringing, like like Greg uh, would say, you bring this message to Junior and tell him that we are not going to stop shooting until they, the first word out of the mouth that the meeting has to be, you are recognized as the boss. Teddy would come back and say, nah, he wants you to keep talking. He wants peace. He wants peace. He wants to keep talking it out. And Greg told me, there's no way Junior said that. There's no fucking way Junior say he's, his message would be, take that cocksucker out. Right. One person he had to answer to in the whole wide world, Vic Arena, <laughs> and he wasn't happy. That's that's the greed. That's that that ego. Yeah, you know? I want I want this position officially. You did have it. You were an official acting boss, so all you had to do was run the ship and split it with Junior. Mm-hmm. You know, I think he was worried he was going to be knocked down when uh, Carmine's son, Junior Persico's son, came home, and I don't think that was going to happen. I don't think that was the case. Uh, my personal. And I had conversations with Ali about it. I remember him saying, if he would have behaved, he could have kept the position. Mm-hmm. He says, I come out, I take that position, I'm back, in, I'm back in the can in six months. You know, so not immediately anyway. Maybe ultimately he would have wanted the position, but he was a cousin. He was Junior's cousin. So he should have been more loyal. Right. But Greg said he, he, was, he, was, he wasn't a powerful, tough guy. He was very big earner big money Mm -hmm. and junior thought he could control him and never lose the power but the problem was other people controlled him too right greg had said if he put a guy like himself if he would put a guy like me not me me greg telling me this or uh joe t named four or five guys 
they would never try to take the family from Junior. You know, and they anybody comes to tell them to do it, they're going to tell them, talk like that once more, you're dead. Right. You know, you're done. Right. I don't want to hear that. You know, Vic didn't do it. He listened. And then John Gotti was integral, major problem for us because he wanted Vic to win. The reason is Vic's underboss, Joe Scopo, grew up with Johnny, John Gotti. And John... All the egos put together, his was still bigger. He wanted to be the boss of all bosses. There, there isn't any more. You know, there's equals. They're at the commission, they're all equal. But he wanted to have the strongest vote on the commission. So if Vic wins the war, and this came out later, it's a fact, they were going to kill Vic themselves and let Joe Scopo become the boss so him and John would have two votes on the commission. Wow, man. Yeah. Shit is ruthless. Oh, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. What is it like? Is there any thing left over in this kind of mob gang world well, today? I'll tell, like, I, is I'm there... going to tell you what uh, Nick Pelleggi said in one of the, the write-ups for our ultimate TV series. What's left is... Uh, sp- a few scattered guys going after the roadkill or well, picking up the road. I can't, I forgot the exact words, but that there's just a few guys left. There's vultures and just, picking meat off the bones. Exactly. Pick it. Yeah. There's nothing left, you know, uh, because the guys that I grew up under that I saw and I had to answer to were seasoned old school guys that you may see in some movies. Right. Okay. Now they scrape the bottom of the barrel. They don't dress the same. They don't act the same. They don't have the same ethics. Uh, uh, you know, they wear ho- hoodies like street gangs. I mean, you know, it's a different it, culture for sure. It, it is. It is. It is. And the, the families are, are, are totally weakened. Uh, I think and it must be harder to kill people nowadays. I would think. Oh, it is. And I think, you know what? I had always said, that was our downfall. I said, if I ever started something, uh, I would say no killing. Beat the guy up until he leaves on his own. Just keep beating him up. Every time you see him, give him a beat. And eventually, he's going to leave. Right. It's just as good as, yeah, and we don't have to face life. I believe, and Sammy told me just recently, and he might have heard it somewhere too, there's a no-kill edict, if that's the right word. Edict is like a law, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the exact words he used. There's a no-kill so there hasn't been. You haven't read it. I'm mean, used to read, you know, almost a few a month. A few a month. You know, did you see a body, somebody got killed, somebody's missing. Right. Now you don't. I mean, the last one that I remember reading about was a famous pizza place. Okay, that was somewhat mob uh, owned. Yeah. I say that because I think there was partners. There was a mob guy and the guy that, Knows the recipes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They split up. There was a problem, okay? And one of the guys tried to take the recipe, and they killed him. He was killed in front of his house. It had something to do with the recipe, the pizza recipe. L&B. Wow. It's Pomoni Gardens. That's ridiculous. It's a great, yeah, it's still a great pizza. Uh, if you ever go to Brooklyn, go to L&B. L&B? Yeah. <laughs> it's Pomoni Garden. And there's Pomoni Ice is phenomenal, too. Uh but I got a book for you, so I'm going to give you the book. Okay. I, I Thank wish you. you I, I wish you would have read it first. Yeah. Because you, a lot of these things I'm telling you, uh, you you sort of would have known about it already. Like the restaurants and stuff in New York are just to die for. But not right now. I mean, yeah. New York, I wouldn't go to New York if if uh, everyone I know, everyone I know that was born and raised in the Brooklyn Queens area, mm-hmm. they they never want to go to New York. Like I yeah. would rather no, I'd especially rather cut my now, arm off and go back to New York. Yeah. <laughs> especially now with the politics, the way things oh, are going yeah. on, well, it's, now it's, it is, yeah. it's 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 terrible. It's worse now. Yeah, it's it's horrible. I mean, it's, it's dangerous. It's more dangerous than we were there. And some people want us back. <laughs> they is said, it really well, more you, dangerous? Yeah, when you guys were in the street, none of this shootouts and and you know. Uh, the, the nonsense that you're seeing now, just the, the rioting and looting and stuff, they couldn't. When Al Sharpton marched through our neighborhood, okay, the cops knew it and they were happy. We had more mob guys there from the five families lining up the street 
They weren't allowed on the sidewalk. They had to walk. They could do that much. We didn't care. But they were not going to come near our stores or right. our houses. Okay? Right. So we lined the street where they were walking. Until one knucklehead, and I, and I know the kid too. I knew his brother well. Runs in there and stabs Al Sharpton. He had stabbed the guy arrested. He did time for it, yeah. What the he, fuck? Right in front. There's cops all around. All the mob guys are there. And he just run, he runs in, in the middle of the parade and stabs out shop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's insane. Needless to say, he's not a good fella. <laughs> Never made it there. How did you end up getting in touch with Robert De Niro? Well, the cops that were on my case, I told you, became their security guys. Yeah. And he was looking for somebody... From the old, from the life, that can give him some tips on playing like a, a, a Frank Sheeran type of guy, a, a mob guy, a hitman, mm-hmm. or whatever. And they all said me, and it, you know, it, and it's funny too. I, I've said this a few times. It's 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 a double edged sword. They all said me, so I'm going to tell you how to kill a guy, how to get rid of weapons, how to bury a body. I mean, that's what you would think. But he also wanted to get the. The verbiage, the words, the the uh, mm. how and, and and situations. How would this happen? How would a guy, knowing he's in trouble, not run, not just run when you reach into your pocket, or, you know, and things like that? So because there, there's a scene in there where he's got to kill a guy, and uh, the guy knows he's in trouble. So so I told him how Greg did it. Greg used to have a handkerchief, and he would sneeze or cough, and he reach it, go to his pocket, and the guy would see the handkerchief come out, and he'd actually be relieved. So he'd wipe his nose. When he put the hanky back in, he comes out with the gun. So that oh, was a little trick wow. of his. Yeah, a so, psychological. Yeah, I, I told him how we got rid of weapons, and all of that's in the movie. I mean, every, so probably a dozen things that I sat and talked to him about. So what, was it like a one-time meeting? No, I, I was like? with him probably three or four times. Where'd you guys meet? Like, what'd you guys? guys well, go we to met at his his, his his. He has a hotel in Greenwich Village. Yeah, and his office is right there. Okay. Yeah. So the first time I spent about three hours with him, and he was just listening to me, and I kept saying, "Mr. D, you want to say something?" I mean, you know, so no, no, keep going, keep going. He was just listening, and getting words and hearing about hits and from my book. Uh, then the next time he gave one of the cops a list of things, and I got on the phone with him. Then another time, we went back and we sat in his living room. Uh, we went to Scorsese's house one time. And really? He, yeah. Yep. And he had uh, he wanted me to meet Martin Scorsese, and he had uh, uh, two casting directors there, who were also listening to me. So they were all for, for using it for their own casting reasons, you know. Uh, and ultimately, I I was going to get a part. I didn't know what, and it wound up being a small part where I killed Albert Anastasia in the barber seat. Uh. Which was a famous or infamous hit in New York back in the fifties, so it was it was an incredible experience. And then, uh, probably a month or so later, I'm in Nick Pelleggi's house, and Nick Pelleggi wrote Goodfellas, Casino, uh, part of American Gangster. Whoa. Yeah, he's he's uh, the the three of them. Uh, you know, my wife was with me throughout the whole thing. We said we are sitting with cinematic royalty. That's what it is. Oh, the Nero Scorsese yeah, and Pelleggi. Are. It was amazing. Are you kidding me? And, uh, and then I, I met him twice after. As a matter of fact, the last day, I got a picture here I could show you. The last day of filming, he invited us in to watch the last scene. It was him. He was filming just, you know, uh, a, a small scene. Just if when you see the movie, you'll see that he has to put a lock on, on a truck. And there's significance to that. But it was funny. He made it. He, he tied a knot two different ways. And Scorsese caught it. He says, Bob, earlier on, you tied a different knot. So he had to tie it the same exact way. So De Niro went like this to him. <laughs> <laughs> but they're friends. I mean, and he yeah, went yeah. back and he had to do the scene again, you know. And uh, Yeah, it's crazy yeah. when you, you think about all like the little continuity details like that yeah. when you're making a movie. Yeah. Like, everything has to, because in case well, they got to cut Kelly got together. to watch him film my scene through the camera. He still uses the old-fashioned cameras. A lot of guys use these new things, handhelds and stuff. He uses the old, the big one that rolls. Film cameras? Yeah, the old, just, uh, yeah. And uh, she was able to look through it and watch exactly what he saw. So they would come, and we did, my scene, when you see it, it's, it's really short, but it's probably 20 seconds. We filmed it 40 times. Really? Once he got a wall, too much of a brick wall, and he said, people aren't coming to the movies to see a brick wall. 
He always got, it's always, uh, then another time, one of the girls walking by me smiled. And he says, what are you smiling about? What do you think, you're in a movie? <laughs> she was walking a baby. So she couldn't smile. Uh, and then, you know, Big Bob, one of the cops uh, that uh, actually wrote the forward for my book, the only part of the book I didn't write, uh, because I had to write about myself, you know, in the forward. Uh, right. He's the bouncer. Uh, the bodyguard. Okay. He's a big guy. He's probably as tall as this. He comes walking through. They want them to look menacing. So a bunch of times he came through and he would give me the eye and that makes people think he was in on it because nobody knows for sure if the bodyguard was in on it mm. or he wasn't. So him okay. looking at me, you know, gives it, and then right. we walk up the steps and uh, then I play, I had another part in, in, a, in a TV series called uh, The Perfect Murder. And yeah, I, yeah, I heard of that. I, I played a corrupt ex-cop working for the mob. So, and the the mob guy I was working for was uh, Joe Pesci's character in Casino. Uh, oh, no shit. Tony Spilatro. Yeah. 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 And the, it's funny, too, uh, we have on our desk a, you know, a possible uh, story about, uh, more about this this guy, because he worked, the bar I was, uh, I was behind the bar in the scene, and I also popped out of the back seat with a gun. You ever see that? It's in every show. Somebody comes out of the back seat oh, with a gun. yeah, of course. Yeah, I was the guy. But uh, the, in the scene in the uh, in the bar was this the, this guy, and now uh, it's called a cra uh, the Crazy Horse 2. It's a okay. cabaret in Vegas. But it's was a violent, I mean, the bouncers in there were killing people, burying them in the desert. If they weren't paying bills, they were beating them. I mean, it was bad. There was drugs. It's almost like a Studio 54 type of movie. But we have, you know, we have somebody that wants us to see if we could uh, get our producer to do that. My wife's the manager now. She does. Oh, cool. She she does all the managing for all the all the people we bring in, and we've got several. We've got several. That's we have, have a show starting. Uh, they're going to start filming it uh, in, in June. It's all about paranormal and Bigfoot and, and stuff like that. Uh, but it's mob-related because it's an ex-mobster that really, really believes in this stuff. And he goes tr tracking them down. Tracking and, Bigfoots? Yeah, and, and paranormal stuff. But they have all the equipment. And they, they say that, you know, we, we're using our skills from tracking people in the street that we had to go after years ago. Oh, my God. To crazy. Yeah, so, but it's, it's going to be... I think it's going to be lighthearted, but it's real, but it's going to, there's going to be humor. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no way yeah. it's going to be because right. these are ex-mob guys. Dramatized. And they're talking like mob guys, you know, and he tells, like, there's a scene, he tells one of them who's a martial arts guy, he says, we run into Bigfoot. You're going to have to use all your moves on him. <laughs> Dead serious, you know, and I'm, but I laugh too, like you just did it. Or like if you see a ghost, you have to pull your gun on him, shoot him. Well, they have stuff. They're going to have rabbis and priests in case they run into an exorcism situation you right. know so uh but we have like a, a little portfolio you know oh, that's awesome you know uh anyway yeah so what was it like going into martin scorsese's house what and well, where where was his house okay it's near central park in manhattan very exclusive so it's, like a penthouse. it's 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 a four-story uh brownstone those are very very rich houses yeah very very what do you mean what does that mean it, it's a it's a type of house. Uh, yeah, it's they're they're all built together side by side. Is it like on the ground level? There's a ground level. Okay. Then there's four stories, but each one you, is, is your house. It's they're huge. So we go in. A butler opens the door. Is it kind of like what? I don't know if you've ever seen the pictures of Jeffrey Epstein's house in New York. Probably. Or it's like between these big buildings and you just go, it looks like a cathedral. Yeah. No, this, no, this, I, I know what you're talking about. Uh, it's more, how would you describe it, Kel? Can you find it on Google? Yeah. You could, yeah. You could. Katie, can you find a picture of a brownstone house in New York? Yeah. So anyway, his was white. Yeah. <laughs> and it's four stories. We walk in. I don't know I'm going to his house. I'm, I know I'm meeting him, but I'm assuming we were going to go to a restaurant or a studio or yeah. something. So he brings us upstairs, the butler, to like the third floor. And it's one huge living room. Okay? There was another room the other way. It might have been a bedroom. Whatever, but So we're sitting down. All of a sudden, I, I, I just start walking around. And she's, Kelly's telling me, sit down. You can't be walking around. We don't know where you're at. You're just looking around at shit? So I go. I see the Oscars. He has a oh, thing. Oh, no way. So I'm looking at the Oscars. I said, this is Marty's house. Martin Scorsese's house. So I, I turn around. Who's standing in the door? De Niro. So he comes over, he sits, says hello, sits down, then Marty comes down with the two girls. 
and it was uh it was it was amazing we were t- talking and it was you know a couple of times i i cursed and I, I i apologized because i don't like to curse i don't try you know uh anyway it's another story but uh <clears throat> and i would say i'm sorry excuse me one of the okay and, yeah, yeah 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 those are all over new york yeah and they um like less than off of the distance yeah exactly so you see the the red one in the middle there that one? Yeah, but it was it was like that, but a white one. It was a white one. So, okay, okay. Yeah, you might have zeroed in on his house. Who knows? It like it just blends in with the rest of the houses. You can't yes, even tell it's exactly. But inside, they're incredible, and uh, you know they're they're very they're very uh, expensive. I mean, right. very expensive. Nick Pelleggi and those stu- uh, has those like stairways that just go right to the sidewalk. Yes, every single and one. And then of them. there's a basement. There's a floor level also. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's a it's a style from from back then, but yeah, those are cool looking. Yeah, Nick Nick. When we went to see Nick Pledgy, he had the. Uh, we went on the second floor. And there was nothing but books. When he came in, he came from upstairs down. He says, uh, "My wife made me buy this unit also for my books." Oh. He lives in the penthouse. And that downstairs was sort of his office, his reading, oh his library. God. Yeah, amazing. But he had a big spread of food out for us. i never forget it. He says, my mother would never forgive me if I didn't put out food for guests. God, so, that had have been so yeah. surreal. No, it was amazing. He's he's a very nice guy, Nick Pelletti. Yeah. Very nice. I could I call him. He, he always answers back. Uh, Who's Scorsese? No, uh Oh, Nick Pelleggi. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, at the beginning, I was in contact a lot with De Niro, but he wound up with uh, personal issues with going through divorce. And, yeah. and I think other thing, now with the pandemic, he's got businesses all over New York that got to be getting killed. His oh, restaurants, yeah. his hotels. Oh, yeah, man. So uh, he's sort of just been, I think he's in seclusion almost, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Scorsese, I, I haven't uh, talked to again. Uh, but, you know, he, he when we were leaving, he made us come back in. Because his wife wanted to meet us. So we went back in and we met her. And then at the final day of filming, she was there. And she has, I believe, Parkinson's. Mm. I think that's what it is. Uh, so she's having a little trouble. But she remembered us. All these months later, she was very, you know, so down. And he's, he's a nice guy. He was very personable. Like, De Niro's quiet. Yeah. Shy. Yeah. Scorsese, he talks, he laughs about, you know, he's outgoing, you know, they're almost opposites. That's so funny, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the other thing I learned is that these casting directors, you don't have to be the greatest actor, okay? Because if you see, if you start watching a lot of De Niro's movies, his idiosyncrasies are always there. He, you know, most of his movies, the way he laughs, the way he look at you, mm-hmm. you know, so when they're casting somebody, they're looking for certain things, you know, like uh, not that he's not a great actor. I mean, because he's done things like I saw out of character, like the Deer Hunter and Cape Fear. Those were fabulous. I mean, yeah. fantastic. The, the gangster movies to me, you know, he's got like some fascination with gangster mob yeah. stuff. Yeah, well, it's it's a been a huge money maker. It's yeah, a huge money right. maker. So you know, uh, but uh, you know, and then there's guys that can you know, go back on stage and play Hamlet, you know. Right. You know, but those, you know, those are... But anyway, I've noticed that. That's why you see a lot of the same guys in the same movies. Not because they're great. It's just because they they almost don't have to act. Mm -hmm. Like in The Sopranos. Yeah, it's almost like he's got, like, that brand built around himself where it's like, you know, you just want this guy in your movie because it makes it marketable, you know. Right. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. No, he's a brand, without a doubt. You know, he's in a movie that's going to sell... So, well, he still may be in mine. And let me, the, the name of the book, I'm going to bring it to you. I wish I had yeah. it here to show you. Yeah. Uh, to show the fans, too. It's, it's called yeah, tell, The Life. Tell, tell people where they can find it and, and where they can download it, whatever. Yeah. It's called The Life. There is a Kindle version. Uh, the difference is you don't get the pictures. And I have some really nice pictures in there of all the people I've met, including De Niro, Pelleggi, uh, uh Mike Madsen, uh, Armand DeSante, who wrote a, 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 a testimonial that's just was phenomenal, uh, and he's a great guy. Armand Desante, he's the one that played John Gotti in, oh, in the movie okay, Gotti, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the original. And he also not John Travolta. <laughs> no, 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 he wasn't good for that part. Uh, and I like John Travolta, but not for that part. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you could get it on there. Okay. Or you can go to my website. It's www.larrymaza-thelife.com. 
Awesome. Man. Yeah. And uh, there I sign every book that goes out. I, some mornings I spend hours signing them. Like probably after your show, I'll get uh, a bunch, I hope. And uh, so I sign everyone. And like I said, the pictures, it's worth getting the book for the pictures. Right. They do those pictures. You could put a face to every name I said today, like Junior Persico, you know, and then Carmine Sessa. When you look and see them, and I, I think they're important. I think they're important. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. I love pictures. Yeah, and you get a picture of Greg, the Grim Reaper. And when you see the picture of him, you're going to say, if in the on the mobster in the dictionary is his picture. Oh, really? That's how he, yeah, he dressed that way, you know, the uh, fancy watch. The and he was the guy ring. who did the 666, like he would carve yes. 666 yeah. when he killed no, people? No, 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 that, that's, that's a myth. What happened was we all had beepers back then. We didn't have cell phones. So we would have a code. Like, say, the guys from uh, 13th Avenue, which was our avenue, were going to beep us. It would be 013, so we knew who was beeping us. Then the next thing would be a number of where to meet. And we had like 12 different numbers. One was Nathan's, one was L&B, one was uh, uh, you know, a, a, a McDonald's somewhere, one was a diner, yeah. all over the city. He, it all, actually, to try, you know, Jersey. So, so we knew this was the, per and if it was 11, it was the Persicos. He took the code 666. So they knew it was him. So he would put 666-8, <laughs> which was a restaurant in Sheepshead Bay, dash the time at one thirty. So that's how we communicated because hmm. we didn't have cell phones. Was did he did he listen to like heavy metal music or was he like into nah, the devil? No, nah, he liked the uh, no, nah, definitely not. No, no, <laughs> nah, he was a uh, traditional. He liked the uh, he liked Barry White. He liked that type of music. Oh, okay, he liked uh, Frank Sinatra, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jerry Vale. And I listen to all that. Even to this day, I still like that kind of music. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Dude, thank you so much. This was uh, uh It's a pleasure. Uh, super fascinating story. Uh, you know, story. what I like about, what I really enjoyed was we talked about some different things. You know, I'm tired of talking about the hits from before the war. You know? Yeah. They, they, they were never easy. I regret those. The hits during the war, uh, talking about them, it's a little easier because it was kill or be killed. You right. know? And, uh... uh you know, you had to survive, and uh, you couldn't show weakness. But a, a lot of people want to hear, "Oh, the first time you did this, the first time you did that." I'm I'm so happy you didn't do that. There's there's more to me than that. Yeah, you know. No, I and, think it's and, it's yeah. a lot more fun yeah. to just yeah. get to know somebody yeah. and just have a, a loose conversation yeah. than just like go you know do bullet point questions mm -hmm. like some of the other interviews. Yeah. But. No, definitely, Cal. Yeah. Come here for a second. I want to introduce my manager. You don't mind, do you? Not at all. You look great. Yeah. It's my manager. Hi. Get, get, get a little lower in his face. And I was, I was uh, her trainer. That's how we met. Oh, really? In the gym, yeah. That's Actually awesome. kickboxing. So. <laughs> that's, a so. that's beautiful, man. Yeah. Well, cool. Thank you. I'm happy well, for you guys. Uh, Thank uh, you so much for being uh, here again. May, maybe we'll do it again. We'll have to. We're we, only we, a we, couple we hours do, away from each other. We could do a part two for sure.